Hello and welcome to our computer crimes class. This is going to be chapter 10, Digital Laws and Legislation from Cybercrime and Cyberterrorism, fourth edition, uh, Taylor, Fritz, Leiderback, Saylor, and Tafoya. For those of you watching in the Canvas LMS, this will also be available through uh, my YouTube channel. So you can watch it there if you like. So what are we talking about? Our learning objectives for this particular chapter is we want to explain the intent and fundamental concepts of search and seizure law as it applies to cybercrime. So many people by this time taking this particular course may already have an exposure to search and seizure, the Fourth Amendment, and we're going to expand that knowledge uh, looking at how it's related to cybercrime. Identify situations where search and seizure is possible without a warrant and describe its limits. Describe the federal statutes that govern electronic surveillance and communications networks. Discuss the issues presented regarding the admission of digital evidence at trial. And identify and discuss the significant U.S. Supreme Court cases focusing on cybercrime and evidence. So search and seizure law for digital evidence. This is a, obviously an ongoing thing. It's constantly changing because the digital world is constantly staging. So our current body of search law is the ongoing product of the interaction of legislation, case law, and constitutional law. Unfortunately, search and seizure law has failed to keep up with the changes brought by uh, increases in cyber crimes and increasing need to collect digital evidence. Uh, you'll note this in some states use a wiretap law, which also covers digital evidence. But the, the specific wording of those laws does not always meet the needs of our investigations of computer crimes today. And of course, this all goes back to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. And then of course, the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment by state and the federal Supreme Courts. So some important terms, search and reasonable. So what is a search and what is the reasonable application of a search? Uh, search and seizure law does not exist to protect criminals, although some people think so, like, well, why can't we just go and get it? It's there to protect the person's reasonable expectation of privacy. Think about this from your personal perspective. If for some reason, someone were to call the local police department, maybe as an anonymous informant, or even a confidential informant that's known to the police and say, hey, Johnny Jones is, is doing this particular type of crime and all the evidence of this crime is on Johnny Jones's hard drive or on his computer that's located in his home office in his house. Now, would you want the police based upon that anonymous or confidential known informant to be able to just come into your house, seize your computer, and then search for anything. And what if that, that particular informant is lying? The other thing is, is you may, you may have some things that are inappropriate on your computer that you don't want the whole world to see. And you certainly don't want your personal business out there for the whole world to see let alone the, the, the local police department. So that is why we have the Fourth Amendment and search and seizure law to protect your individual rights as a person. It's not there to protect the criminals, although it certainly becomes an obstacle to an efficient, if you remember the term crime control, an efficient way of going after the criminals the Bill of Rights, and specifically in this case, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, do stand in the way, and their goal is to protect the average citizen, but certainly it makes it a little bit harder to go after a criminal. And that is what we call uh, being fair in the system. To have due process as required under the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So what is a seizure? A seizure of property occurs when there's some meaningful interference with an individual's possessory interest in that property. 
So if an officer takes your cell phone, that is considered a seizure. A search is an attempt by officers to obtain evidence. So the officer takes your cell phone from you and then proceeds to look through it at your address book, at the pictures that you have there, at whatever. That would be the search part of it. So we have two different things, a search and a seizure. So a seizure is when the item is taken, a search is when you're actually looking for, for evidence. Because maybe that item is not the evidence in and of itself, but something on that item uh, in the digital world, whether it be your cell phone or your computer or the hard drive or external hard drive, whatever it might be, is what we're gonna search. And as you may know, the Supreme Court in, in a ruling a few years back said that you know, officers, when they take or seize an item from an arrested person, such as a cell phone, they cannot routinely look through that phone without a warrant. Because that's considered a, a, an improper search. All right, searches with warrants. So in some courses, when you're doing uh, cyber crimes, you're going to be asked to justify, you know, why, what would you need to search? And under the Fourth Amendment, in most cases, unless there's an exigent circumstance, a magistrate or a judicial officer must authorize this search. And that is authorized by what we call a search warrant. So in order to obtain the search warrant, law enforcement must show probable cause. So they have to establish, one, that a crime has been committed. So you have to be able to show the judicial officer, well, this crime happened. We believe this crime happened, and you have to be able to explain why you think that crime happened. Evidence of this particular crime exists at a particular place. So that, that's the next part, is that evidence presently exists in the place to be searched. So in the case, and you say place to be searched, that place might be a certain object. Let's say that upon the, an arrest on the street after a traffic stop, an officer seizes a telephone, a cellular phone, smartphone, whatever the current term might be. And that officer believes that there is some evidence of a crime, whether it's the fact that the person that got arrested is, is a, a narcotics dealer of some car, a drug dealer involved in some other crime, and the officer believes the evidence of the crime is on the phone. That officer has to be able to show the judicial officer that there is a crime, that the evidence of the crime exists, and that that evidence exists on that phone to then get the office, the judicial officer, judge, magistrate, to authorize the search of that device. And that means that that judicial officer is going to create a warrant. And of course, that judicial officer has to be legally authorized under their proper jurisdiction to provide that warrant. So what happens if you have a flawed search? Well, the remedy for that under years of history is a suppression of evidence. So for example, let's say, again, we can go back to traffic stop because a lot of cases with regard to flawed searches come back to traffic stops. Some also come back to household searches, business searches, what have you. So we're not gonna get into the whole uh, search and seizure law because that is quite a, a big topic. But we'll give some examples. And a simple example might be that traffic stop. Officer pulls over a car. For some reason in their head, they think, hey, this, this guy's got drugs in the car. They don't have any kind of reasonable suspicion. They don't have probable cause. They just have this feeling. I know Johnny Jones is a drug user. I know Johnny Jones is a dealer. And I think today he's probably carrying. So that officer pulls Johnny Jones over, gets him out of the car, and then proceeds to search the car without probable cause, without consent, without any valid reason to search. So what happens when Johnny, when, when the officer then finds a, a, a bag of marijuana under the driver's seat, or they find a gun under the driver's seat, or something else in the car that is contraband or illegal. Well, if when we go to court, 
Johnny Jones hopefully has a lawyer who is good enough to recognize that the search was illegal and would then uh, request that that evidence be suppressed. And the judge usually is going to have what they call a suppression hearing where they're going to hear the evidence and the state, meaning the, the prosecutor, the officer, are going to testify as to what were the reasons for the search, what was the probable cause for the search. And of course, the defense attorney is going to question that and try to show that, no, the officer did not have probable cause for that search. So if the judge finds that, no, the officer had no reason to search, then that evidence is, is not able to be used. You say it's thrown out. What thrown out means is it can't be used at trial. It means that we can't use that bag of marijuana as part of the prosecution of Johnny Jones. We can't use that gun that was found under the seat to prosecute him for illegal possession of a weapon if in fact that was the case. We can't use it. He can't be charged based upon that particular pieces, those particular pieces of evidence. So in some cases, law enforcement may face civil liability, which means maybe you get a civil suit. Uh, good faith doctrine is sometimes a defense of a flawed search. So there have been Supreme Court cases where if the prosecution was able to convince a judge that the officer acted in good faith and there was no uh, ill intent, sometimes those searches have been allowed and that evidence has been uh, kept into the case. Exclusionary rule, which is something that obviously every criminal justice student at this point should be well aware. This particular lecture is based upon a 400 level course in computer crimes. So by now you've had your introduction to criminal justice class, you've had criminology, you've had uh, policing, you've had courts, you, you have had a criminal law class, maybe multi, more than one. So you, you have had uh, multiple exposure to these particular issues. So you might already know what the exclusionary rule is. The exclusionary rule basically says that if evidence was improperly attained, anything that's based upon that evidence or that evidence that was improperly obtained is excluded from the case. So if there's improperly obtained evidence and it was improperly obtained, that evidence could then be excluded from the case or as in a previous slide, suppressed. Now there's another rule called the, the fruit of the poisonous tree. Fruit of the poisonous tree con uh, concept basically says that if you had some illegal evidence, you, you found, you improperly obtained evidence and that evidence led you to something else. Well, anything that is the fruit of that evidence can also not be used. So you would have to show that that second item could have been found some other way. But if it was found only because of the illegally obtained evidence. Let's say that after you arrested somebody, you asked them where the gun was or where the body was or whatever, and they were not properly Mirandized, so they weren't aware of their right to remain silent. And they then told you where that evidence was. And then you went and you found that evidence based upon the illegally or improperly obtained statement it is possible that that evidence could be thrown out of the case based upon the concept of the fruit of the poisonous tree. Uh, one case you should probably look up, Map versus Ohio, which explains this a little bit. So the idea is we want to curb police abuse of civil rights, deter misconduct, so these items are excluded. So officers should be aware that you know, if they do illegal searches, that they're not going to get anything out of it because the evidence that they've gotten from the illegal search is going to not going to be able to be used in a case or excluded. All right, defenses. As I said, if you could come up with a, a different source for the same information, then you could possibly use that evidence. If you have evidence that was found because, let's say, the person said, yeah, the body's over there and the officers found the body, that led us to get into it faster. But if we would have found it anyway, that's called inevitable discovery. And there was actually a classic case 
of, of a man who was arrested for a homicide. And uh, on the way, they had the officers had to go to another town to, to collect him and bring him back. And on the way, the officer was talking to him. The, the, the man wasn't properly Mirandized during the conversation. And the officer was like, you know, you, know, you could really help the family. You could really give them closure if you would tell us where, where the body is. And this was a, a, a unfortunate little girl that, that was murdered. And during this conversation, the arrested person actually revealed that the body was in a field somewhere. So they went and they found the body in a field and were able to collect evidence from the body, other evidence that could have been used in the case against this person. So certainly the defense attorney says, hey, he wasn't Mirandized. So the fact that you found the body because of his statement was inappropriate, illegal, evidence that cannot be used because it was obtained illegally. Well, the ruling in that particular case was that because the body was in an open field, that she would have been found anyway. That's inevitable discovery. So the body and any evidence that was found on the body were permitted to be used in the case because of that uh, defense. Most of the searches that, that police officers are conducting uh, do not involve a warrant. You know, you have an officer who decides to search somebody based upon probable cause after a traffic stop, say, you know, they pull up on a car in a place where, where marijuana is still illegal and they smell the odor of burning marijuana. Well, that may be sufficient for them to then search the vehicle for that marijuana. Uh, or maybe you have an officer who suspects that there's marijuana in the vehicle and they call a police canine or drug sniffing dog, as you know, the term goes, and that dog identifies that there is marijuana or some other drug in the vehicle. That would be sufficient probable cause for the officer to then search. So there's no warrant required. Uh, stop and frisk. Now there's a debate whether you know, a frisk is, is a search, but beyond that, if an officer conducts a stop and a frisk appropriately according to the rules set by the Supreme Court during the original Terry versus Ohio case, which the, per the officer has to have a reasonable articulable suspicion that the person is involved in crime before they stop them. And then in order to frisk them, they have to have a belief uh, that they may be armed and fear for their safety for who the officer can frisk. So if the officer then frisks, and feels an object and they can, based upon their feel, have an idea of what that item is, whether they feel a knife, they feel a gun, or maybe they feel what they believe is a packaging for, for drugs, then they would search. They would actually go in and get that item. That would be a search. Again, no warrant required. Of course, it's gonna be contested and the officer has to, is gonna to have to explain what was the basis for the stop? What was the basis for the frisk? And then when you did the frisk, what was the basis for the search? Consent search. Consent search basically said, is when someone says, sure, go ahead. So under, under the US Constitution, basically someone can verbally say, yes, you can search my belongings. So the officer stops the person again, get to the motor vehicle stop, and the officer says, well, would you mind if I searched your car? And the person says, sure, go ahead. I got nothing to lose. And then the officer searched the car and the officer finds the bag of weed under the seat that the person forgot they left there, right? And they get charged and then they try to contest it and say, well, the officer didn't have a warrant. Well, based upon U.S. Supreme Court decisions, if the person gives consent, a warrant is not required. Now, in some states, like where I used to work in the state of New Jersey, you have to have additional things based upon our own Supreme Court decisions. So officers have to get written consent to search and there's a specific form that is used for that written consent. And you have to advise the person that they have the right to stop the search at any time. So that's an additional hurdle that based upon the state constitution is there. But again, you still don't need a warrant. Exigent circumstances. But exigent circumstances is basically if there's a situation that you can articulate where if we don't search now, we could lose the evidence. 
So it's like if the person could easily destroy the evidence, if it's you know a car on the street, one of the things that there's an automobile exception that you know if you don't search it now, the vehicle could be gone and you'll never get that evidence. And of course, I'm not gonna get into the, the specific details of all those exigent circumstances, but there are a number of them. Uh, how about, you know, if you think that there's something going on in a house and somebody's gonna get hurt, an officer may, for public safety purposes, break into a home to try to uh, help someone. And then when they break into the home, then they find contraband all over the place. They can still use that even though they did not have a warrant to search. A search into incident to arrest. Fairly simple. An officer who is arresting someone can search a person and the area generally around them within their control, which has been called the wingspan, for things that might harm the officer. So basically anything that's on their person and anything that would be in their normal reach. So if it's in the car, it would be the passenger compartment of the vehicle. If it's in a house, it might be anything that's within the room that they could have they could reach for. But let's say in the car, uh, stop. I'm sorry, search engine to arrest would not include the trunk. You'd have to have some other circumstances for that, and it certainly wouldn't include searching an entire house if you arrest somebody in their living room. Uh, plain view is basically if an officer is in a place, or a law enforcement officer, it could be you know police officer, FBI agent, whatever is in a place where they legally can be and they can see something that's illegal, then they have the right to then search that area and seize it. They can't move stuff around to increase their plain view, but if it's something right there, uh, there was a case in my town years ago where uh, one of our canine officers went out for a walk. And during the course of the walk, uh, within a public area, he could see right through a uh, glass sliding door and the person, the occupant of this apartment had a marijuana plant in plain view. And again, you know, marijuana, still illegal in New Jersey, still illegal in Pennsylvania for uh, recreational use. So that was clearly an illegal thing. So that officer did have the right to seize that particular plant. What we also did that particular evening, I was actually working that night, is, okay, you got a marijuana plant there, I can charge you with that. Would you mind if I searched the rest of your property? And at the time, I don't know if we required, it was so long ago, I don't know that the, uh, the written consent was required. It might've been, but these guys gave consent. There was a two, two guys living in an apartment and they gave consent to search the apartment and they probably shouldn't have because then other things were found. Because who knows whether the police actually want to go the next level if they have sufficient evidence at hand to convince a judge that they're going to get a search warrant. We probably would have been able to do that, but I'm not sure. You know, a judge might say, well, there's one plant. That doesn't mean we can search the whole house. And some judges would deny it. So, you know, it might be a better thing is you just say no. But you got to make that individual decision. And of course, criminal justice students, nobody's violating the law, so you won't have to worry about this. Uh, you're gonna be on the law side, right? A border search. Everybody knows if you're coming into the country from somewhere else, the border Customs and Border Patrol does have the right to search if they, they feel the need to search your car, search your person, whatever. Uh, if you're coming in internationally, coming in on an airplane, again, Customs, you have to go through Customs and they could potentially search you. I know I went to France back in November, long before anybody knew about this COVID-19 thing, which apparently was here in this country already, uh, from what I'm hearing now. And when we came back to the country, you know, we just had to present our documents. And actually, there's a kiosk in the Philadelphia airport where you present your documents and then you just go through. And they just check your documents as long as they're convinced that you're okay, you're good to go. You know, they don't, they're not searching you. Uh, of course, on getting on the plane, as we all know, anybody, well, we don't, I know that not everybody's traveled on airplanes, but you've probably heard of it at least, that you have the, uh, you can be searched getting on a plane by TSA, Transportation Security. That's to make sure that we don't have people bringing weapons or explosives on a plane that could be used to hijack or destroy the plane. You know, that got really, really uh, strict since 9-11. 
you know, 19 years ago. So, and I obviously having traveled a little bit last year, I've been through that. And I, I've been to the point where I actually was frisked by a TSA officer because for whatever reason, the uh, magnetometer that they used or the scanner that they used indicated that there was something on my person. Of course, they didn't find anything. So apparently the device wasn't working right. But the border, can, can, they can conduct a search. And lastly, searches without warrants, and this is an interesting one, searches by private citizens. Well, what does that mean? And we're probably gonna get into more detail in additional slides, but then I'll just you know quickly go through them since I talked about these already. But searches by private citizens. All right, maybe you work for a company and that company provides you with a locker where you get to store your stuff. Or this is cyber crimes class, maybe as part of your employment, you are you have the use of a computer, whether it be a desktop in an office, or maybe they give you a laptop as Pierce College gives me a laptop. That device belongs to the company. So if the IT guy goes into your laptop to fix something and they find that you're storing porn on your on your you know issued computer, they can actually then turn it over to the police. No warrant required, no probable cause required. It was the IT guy that found it. They discovered it. They then turned it over to police. Now, if the police want to search the computer further, they would then need to do the warrant thing. But that initial fine is they're good to go. So it could be a computer, or we can also use you know, the desk, the desk in your office. You don't necessarily have a right to privacy in your desk. Or like I do have a locker at the college that locker combination is available to administration. So if they decide for whatever reason to go in there, they can. And some companies, if you get terminated, laid off, whatever, sometimes if they're, you know, a lot of companies, they're like really, really careful. They don't let you back in the building. So they actually have one of their people go into your locker, go into your desk and put your stuff together and give it to you. You can't go back in some companies. I've heard horror stories about that where you have your, you know, you, you've been there for a number of years and you have all your personal stuff in your locker or in your desk, whatever, and you can't even go and get your own stuff. Well, what happens if they go into the locker and they find illegal stuff that they can turn over to police? Same thing with the computer. All right. So we talked about stop and frisk a little bit already. Law enforcement officer has a right uh, to self-protection during a brief interview by conducting a frisk. So we talked about that. That's based upon the Terry versus Ohio decision. Officer has to be able to articulate why they're stopping the person in the first place. And then they have to have uh, some feeling that the person has a weapon on them. They can't just do it routinely. Supreme Court decision does not allow that every time I stop somebody, I frisk them. I have to be able to articulate, you know, what is it that I fear or feel that's on this person? Uh, it's possible to identify sources of digital evidence during a stop. There's not a clear justification to analyze such evidence under stop and frisk. So if I take a phone off of somebody, uh, there's not a clear justification to actually go through the phone. But you do have to have probable cause that the device was used in a crime and a warrant should be tamed to analysis. So you could seize it if you have probable cause to believe, but you can't search it without getting the warrant. And that makes sense. If you can seize something, why would the courts allow us to go and immediately search it if we can hold on to it? Unless there's some other exigent circumstance, like for some reason we think that the, the stuff's going to time out and be destroyed. But usually in digital cases, if you seize it, then you can sit on it and get the appropriate uh, stuff, the appropriate paperwork. The problem is something like, like an iPad. All right, you can actually remotely wipe your iPad. So it's quite possible that that exigent circumstance might be, well, this iPad, we know that remotely the owner or someone else can actually log into their iCloud account and they can wipe all the data off the iCloud, off the iPad. So or you can even do that with an iPhone. So that could potentially be an exigent circumstance. There's ways around that. One is called, a, there's a, a Faraday bag is something that computer crimes investigators use, which basically blocks all signals into the device. So if you stick it 
you stick the device, the phone, iPad, whatever, into one of these uh, bags, it can't be wiped because it can't get a signal. And then you would take it into a, a secure room so it's not going to get the outside signal. So there's ways around that. But that could potentially be used as an exigent circumstance if the person could you know, remotely destroy the evidence. All right, consent search, we talked about it. Very common. Again, it's just a matter of the officer would need to, to tell the court later on, well, you know, why did you ask, why did you even ask for consent to search? But the court, you know, Supreme Court of the United States basically says if an officer asks and the person says yes, you're good to go. Uh, obviously, the court's going to consider what we call a totality of circumstances. So what was, what was the whole situation going on and why, what led the officer to even ask this question? And of course, the person giving that consent must be legally capable of doing so. So you can't have a person that's like intoxicated or having some other medical issue and say, hey, by the way, can I search your car? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. No, they have to be legally capable of giving consent. Exigent circumstances, as I said, would be some issue where we have to preserve the evidence because it might be in danger of being destroyed or corrupted. So as I said, in the case of an iPad, if somebody could wipe the iPad remotely, there might be exigent circumstances there. Uh, it's possible that the digital data and encrypted data can easily be destroyed or corrupted. So, but the officer does have to be able to prove, be able to articulate to a court, why did you do this? Why did you feel there was exigent circumstances? You have to be able to explain that to the court for that evidence to be kept in, in the case and not suppressed. Again, search incident to arrest is basically officers allowed to search any arrested person for weapons or evidence and the area around them, which is commonly called the, uh, the wingspan. So as I said previously, it would include taking the phone, but not searching the phone. Plain view, again, if I can see it, I can seize it. So the officer sees the item, legally present where they are, uh, immediately recognizes the item, subject to seizure. Here's one court case that supports that. Border searches, again, if you're crossing into a country, usually the border authorities have the, uh, are permitted to search. And this is a court case, court case that uh, uh, supports that. Searches by private citizen. Basically, again, if the person has legal access to the property and they decide to search and they find contraband, they can then turn it over. This is called the silver platter do doctrine, where somebody could find evidence. So you know, your parents go into your room, and they find your stuff, they could call the police. Uh, your employer goes into the computer and finds contraband, they can call the police. Uh, but for the police to search the computer or phone or whatever further, they would then need a warrant for a more complete search or analysis. So there are some laws, I won't get into the, the details. Uh, I would read these in your text, but you have, uh, Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, uh, pen registers and trap and trace devices, chapter of Title 18. These are federal laws that govern electronic surveillance and criminal investigations. So this is what the pen trap statute regulates, collection of addressing information from wire communications. It's been implied, applied to include computer network communications, not just telephones and the courts can authorize installation of a pen trap device anywhere in the United States for up to 60 days and can extend that afterwards. Wiretap statute, this is a federal statute. Keep in mind that every state has their own statutes. So if the police in your local community, whether it be Philadelphia, Ben Salem, uh, Mount Laurel, Cherry Hill, whatever, or the state police are conducting an investigation, they would have to abide by the wiretap statute of the state but they're also confined possibly by the federal law. But if you have an agency like the FBI or Secret Service or Treasury agent, whatever, they then have to use the appropriate uh, federal statute. So Title III of the wiretap statute, 
regulates collection of communication content, contains numerous exceptions. If there's a court order, consent, provider exception. So a provider, so people who have phones, your cell phone provider or your internet provider has the ability to provide certain content that they have access to without your permission. Uh, computer trespass are exception. So if somebody, somebody's trespassing and they find content, they could turn you in. Uh, other extensions, uh, exceptions, extension phone. This is basically if somebody is on an extension, which many of you might not be familiar with, but more of our older students would be aware if you have a landline phone in your house, you have multiple extensions in the house. So if somebody is listening on the extension and they find something, they can turn that in. That's not covered by the wiretap statute. Uh, inadvertently obtain criminal evidence accessible to the public. So if, if what they're listening to is accessible to the public, then that's also an exception to the wiretap statute. So the extension telephone, which means that, you know, maybe an officer is in your house and for some reason picks up one of the phones and they hear you talking, that might be uh, an, an uh, exception to the wiretap statute. Go back to wiretap statute for a moment. Another thing that's covered by the wiretap statute, you have to be aware of, of the state you're in because sometimes wiretap statutes determine whether or not you can record a conversation without, with or without the consent of the other party. So some states, you have a two, there are two party states where it's, let's say I'm having a conversation with you in a classroom, I can't record that conversation legally without your knowledge. Uh, other states are one party states, so any one person who's involved in the conversation can record that conversation, but they don't have to tell the other person. Our Electronic Communications Privacy Act regulates how the government can obtain stored account information from a network service provider, such as your internet service provider. Uh, two categories of computer service, electronic communication and remote computer, serv computer service. And they have to show some type of cause based upon that law to get that information, not necessarily probable cause. I know in, in New Jersey, we could provide, get that type of information with, without a warrant, but we would need like a, a court order or subpoena. Uh, there might be a lower standard to gather that information. Patriot Act. So obviously after 9-11, there were some enhancements that allowed uh, law enforcement to gather more information. So it changed the surveillance procedures. You probably, some of you may have heard about surveillance procedures, you maybe you heard about the FISA court. Uh, Patriot Act updated the rules as, as far as what the federal government could do when investigating primarily terrorist incidents. USA Freedom Act doesn't really change procedural burdens based upon investigators, but it increased judicial oversight. So it made it that there was more judicial oversight on uh, the use of wiretaps. The burdens were still the same, but there were more people looking at it. Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act basically requires telecommunications companies to modify the design of their equipment, facilities, and services to ensure lawfully authorized electronic surveillance can actually be performed by law enforcement personnel. Now, to my knowledge, this does not cover things like, like Apple uh, breaking into somebody's phone because the FBI wants them to, and they kind of refused to do that a couple years back. But the companies do have to make their equipment so it can be tapped so that people can listen in on your conversations if they're legally allowed to. Federal criminal statutes, again, these are in your text and you do have assignments based upon uh, some of these. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, Economic Espionage Act, and the Copyright Act. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the primary statute that targets unauthorized computer use. Uh, protects any computer connected to a network. So pretty much if someone hacks into your computer in your house or you illegally go into like say one of your fellow, uh, one of your coworkers computers, you could potentially be violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. 
Economic Espionage Act imposes criminal penalties on the theft of trade secrets. So, you know, you have people like the Chinese, the Koreans, or even people within this country who are breaking into uh, computer networks or computers and stealing uh, trade secrets. They can be charged under this federal law. So it's either physically or electronically stored. So physically would mean like maybe there's papers that are in a file cabinet and you go into the file and you steal the papers. Or electronically, it would be on the computer. Person stealing a trade secret must know the theft will cause economic loss. So if you steal, you know, the, the, the secret recipe for the secret sauce that's on a certain type of food, and then that company's going to lose money because now you sold it to somebody else. Applies anywhere in the world as long as the perpetrator is a U.S. citizen or company. So you may have heard, and we discussed earlier in the course uh, recently about certain Chinese nationals being indicted here in the United States for theft of certain things. Economic Espionage Act may have been one of the statutes that they violated if they're breaking into businesses digitally and stealing information from those businesses. Copyright Act, this covers uh, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, anything that someone has created is covered by the Copyright Act. So keep that in mind. If you find somebody's music, their academic work, and you put it out there as your own in order to make money off it, you could be charged with violation of Copyright Act. And sometimes even if it's just for personal use, depends upon what it is. So that's why you might know if you, if you ever post something on YouTube or if you're watching videos on YouTube, you may see that, okay, the music that was used in this video has been deleted because the person didn't have the rights to it. Family Entertainment and Copyright Act. It makes it illegal to record, photograph, or otherwise copy a motion picture or other protected work as it is presented or screened. So you are not permitted to go into the movie theater with your cell phone or, you know, your camera and record the movie and then turn around and sell it, you know, a, a pirated copy. So you then can't distribute the copyrighted materials before they are released to the public for commercial profit. That's another interesting uh, law. Admitting evidence at trial. So how do we admit evidence under the federal rules of evidence? Computers contain text, typically can be divided into two categories, a computer generated records or computer stored records. So what judges are gonna be looking at is the authenticity of that material, where it came from. So authenticity, if the computer, so the logs that say, okay, Frank Plunkett logged into this particular computer at this particular time of day, and the computer accessed this particular website where porn was stored. And we can put Frank behind the computer. That's authenticity. Hearsay was maybe there's a file, I typed up a digital document in my word processor, you know, Microsoft Word, and it says something. That would be considered hearsay. All right, authentication, before the government or defendant can move for the admission of computer record as evidence, they have to prove the authenticity of the document. So we want to make sure that we can prove to the court that that digital document has, never, has not been altered, manipulated, or damaged after it was created. Which is why when you see on TV a police officer or investigator opening up a computer and starting playing with the keyboard, generally that's not what happens. Because then you know, the person who's arrested later on said, well, you know, they played with it and they changed stuff or they added stuff. So you want to do this in a really secure environment and make sure that you can verify that nothing's been messed with or changed. It's the same as, as the chain of custody that you would have for collecting any other kind of evidence. You want to make sure it's not been altered. Uh, the reliability of the program that generated the records, questioning the identity of the author. These are things that are going to be challenges to make sure that this is actually authentic stuff. Hearsay. Your state rule exists to prevent unreliable out-of-court statements by people from influencing the outcome of the trial. So when a computer record, let's say a digital document, a recording, whatever, it might contain hearsay because if I, in a recording on my computer, say, you know, Sammy Smith 
robbed the 7-Eleven, that would be hearsay because I'm saying it. There's no actual direct evidence that Sammy Sith robbed, robbed the 7-Eleven. Uh, there is a business record exception because it is assumed uh, that business records are, are accurate and authentic. Best evidence rule, basically, best evidence you, rule is used across the board is that you want the best evidence. You know, what is the best piece that we can get to use in court? So the best evidence rule states that to prove the content of a writing, recording, or photograph, the original writing, recording, or photograph is ordinarily required. So it's always best to have the original. An accurate printout of computer data always satisfies the best evidence rule. So you may not have to bring the actual computer into the courtroom and put the stuff up on a screen. You could actually have a printout of the material that was on the computer. That would be satisfactory. The point is you want to get closest to the best evidence. So let's say, you know, for physical evidence in a, in a criminal trial, you may take a picture of a crime scene. You can't bring the whole room into court with you. So the best evidence that you have might be a, a still picture or a video because you can't bring the actual crime scene into court. You can't preserve it forever so that the, the uh, jury can go visit the crime scene. Imagine if you have a homicide scene in somebody's house and you know the trial doesn't take place for two years later. Are you gonna leave it as is for two years? No, you can't. What about the body? Are you gonna keep the, bring the body into court? No, you can't. But you're gonna have evidence collected from that body that would satisfy the best evidence rule. All right, court cases, this is just a list of significant court cases that are discussed. You, know, you can look in your book to, to see the explanations of them all. And of course, this particular Video is copyrighted, so think about the copyright rules. So nobody can take this particular video or the contents of this slideshow and, and go off and make, and make money on it. All right, it's copyrighted by Pearson Education and it comes from the Cybercrime and Cyberterrorism, fourth edition by Taylor Fritsch, Liderback, Sailor, and Tafoya. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes this uh, overview of chapter 10.